go ahead and get started. All right. All right, so I want to welcome everybody to week three and round three of Ham Fellowship Virtual Debate. I want to welcome everybody again. Yeah, hope you're all staying safe and staying healthy out there. So really want to acknowledge the fellows over the last couple of years for their phenomenal job and outstanding presentations. Last week we had Drs. Plutz, Reisner, and Rambo um, talk about PIP fracture dislocations. Thank you to Ryan Kelsey for uh, moderating the session. And then the second debate was Drs. Garib and Lanier uh, battling out over first dorsal web space. And really want to thank Dr. Higgins for moderating that debate as well. So it's been really great to have an opportunity to engage with everybody and also to really hear different perspectives from different institutions on what everybody's doing differently. So I know kind of across the country, we're looking at a slow return to elective surgery. So I'm gonna be reaching out to everybody as far as getting a poll from the folks on kind of moving forward, what people wanna see and kind of their interest. Starting next week, we're gonna be moving to 5 p.m. Pacific time, so 8 p.m. on the East Coast, just so people can participate a lot more easily. There will be a doodle poll going to, to program directors on kind of what you wanna see going forward, what's your kind of interest level, based on your clinical schedules. Um, can you still do this? Weekly, monthly, topics, timing, and format. So I love feedback from anybody uh, just to try and make this a great program going forward for everybody. So on to week three. So debate number one, we'll be looking at a stage 3B key box with looting fragmentation. And the battle will be between Mayo Clinic and Philly Hand Center. This will be moderated by Glenn Gaston um, out of Ortho, Carolina. And debate number two will be looking at a metacarpal shaft fracture and have a three-way battle between Duke, USC, and North Ortho Carolina. This will be moderated by Dr. Greenberg out of Indiana Hand. And from there, I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Gaston. I don't wanna see what happens first with these, uh, these fighters here. It just keeps going. It just keeps going, that's it? <laughs> that's All right, it. I'll, uh, I'll hop into mine then. All right, then go ahead and stop share there. All right. So as you mentioned, we're gonna start off with some 3B Keen box. If I can make this advance, there we go. So uh, here's tonight's panelists. As you mentioned, we're gonna have Peter uh, is the mentor for Anthony out of Mayo Clinic. And Lee is gonna mentor Vinny out of Philadelphia. So this is what we're interested in. We're interested in 3B Keen box. So we're looking for lunate and carpal collapse with scaphoid rotation. You can see a list of options of surgeries right there out of uh, Lichtman and Greg Bain's recent current concepts, which for those of you interested in reading more, I'd recommend that article on JHS 2016. So here's your case. And I'm gonna give the uh, participants a little uh, artistic liberty case up with a 25 year old male laborer. You can choose to go after a 75 year old low demand female, a 50 year old banker. So I'm gonna leave that open to your interpretation of uh, where we go from here. It looks like these are gonna be the two options we're gonna debate, and we will turn it over to the participants to uh, take it away. I need to unshare, Jerry, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you could. There you go. So Mayo, you wanna lead us off? Everybody hear me? Yep. yep. Okay. So thanks, Dr. Gaston. I'm Dr. Ree and I. I'm Anthony Archel, or the delegation from Mayo, and we'll be advocating for scaphocapitate arthrodesis for treatment of 3B keen box. So though the etiology of and natural history of keen box remains somewhat controversial, most authors agree that stretch transmission across the lunate related to both lunate morphology and ulnar variants play an important role in the pathophysiology of the condition. And although Dr. Lippmann's uh, modif modification of the stall staging system was cutting edge uh, at its time, and it's still clinically relevant today, it's important to remember that this was 1977, and that distinguishing between stages 3A and 3B has demonstrated in several studies to have questionable reproducibility. 
That's why even Dr. Lichtman himself now supports the updated Bain grading system for basing clinical decisions in the management of Keenbox. This uh, system focuses on uh, the number and location of damaged articular surfaces with obvious ramifications in determining who's a candidate for various procedures like proximal row carpectomy. And that begs the question, <clears throat> how many stall Lickman 3B patients are in fact Bain grade three or four and thus not a candidate for PRC? It certainly stands to reason that a badly collapsed lunate would lead to a rapid damage of these articular surfaces. And that's a finding that's not necessarily obvious on preoperative imaging. <clears throat> So here's a case of a 66-year-old secretary who presents with wrist pain. And on both plain radiographs and advanced imaging, I think she qualifies as a 3B. So she seems like a slam dunk PRC. But on direct inspection of the capitate head, it's badly ebernated. So uh, without better data on interposition techniques, we would argue that a PRC in a patient like this risks uh, total risk fusion within a few years. But we have other options. So let's talk about scapocapitate arthrodesis. This is an archway from the Plummer Building here in Rochester. If you look closely, you might see a maskless Mike Pence. Um, if we think of the uh, carpus as an arch, this is a, an analogy from, from Dick Berger that he teaches us. Then the scaphoid is a pillar that provides support to the archway. That makes the lunate the keystone, and the STT joint is the footing of the column. But if the lunate, the keystone, crumbles, then an ST fusion is like bracing this column and restoring stability and thereby maintaining carpal height. In other words, the load that would otherwise be transmitted across the lunate is redirected through the fusion construct and unloads the lunate, lunate preserves carpal height, and preserves the mechanics. So this analogy that Dr. Berger teaches us is cute and it's convenient for our argument. But there's also support in the literature for scapocapitate fusion for treatment of Keenbox. In the largest published series of SC fusions for this indication, Dr. Ree and the group here at Mayo reported 100% union rate uh, with uh, three different me methods of fixation, K-wires, uh, staples, and headless compression screws. 96% of their patients experienced improved or stable pain. And there was a predictable but small loss of motion with 74% of patients returning to their preoperative occupation. Here's a representative case from that uh, series. It's a 32-year-old homemaker, um, mother of three with Keenbox disease. She certainly doesn't have a low demand lifestyle with three kids, um, and she's a bit of a young patient for a PRC. So she underwent SC fusion with two headless compression screws, and uh, part of our technique would be to uh, correct any scaphoid flexion prior to definitive fixation. She healed well, she uh, retained good motion and avoided any alteration of her carpal height. So SC fusion is a good option and it's independent of status, uh, the status of the capitate head or the lunate fossa, but is it really better than a PRC? <clears throat> After all, a lot of very respected people have published about proximal row carpectomy. But if you look critically at these uh, studies, they're all careful to say that it's uh, applicable to early stage Keenbox and that the capitate and lunate fossa must not be uh, affected by arthrosis. And interestingly, there are a few reports that um, Keenbox disease and the associated synovitis may predispose the wrist to uh, global ligamentous problems, thereby destabilizing it in the coronal plane in any procedure, but specifically, particularly PRC. So does that mean we would never do a PRC? Of course not. Um, if the patient is older, they have a low de demand lifestyle. If they have comorbidities that make you think they may uh, struggle to heal a fusion construct, or, uh, and they have good cartilage on their capitate head and their lunate fossa, then it's a reasonable option. But we would argue that this is a minority of stage 3B patients. If anyone knows this woman, I apologize for including her. I don't mean any judgment, but I Googled stock images of elderly smokers, and this is my favorite one. So in summary, um, the PRC revol uh, requires an uninvolved capitate head and lunate fossa, which is in question in these patients, but its lack of fusion construct make it an option for the rare older patient with a low demand lifestyle and preserved joint surfaces. SC fusion, on the other hand, redirects the forces of the wrist around the lunate without disrupting carpal height and allows for correction of the scaphoid hyperflexion that's seen in a 3B patient. Most importantly, it's applicable to the higher grade uh, Bain's classification patients. Thank you.
Very nice. All right, let's have our rebuttal from Philly. You can unshare yours. There we go. Vinny, you may need to unmute. How's that? Yep, got you now. All right. Um, so, despite what you've heard, uh, I think I will convince you by the end of this that PRC is the answer, PRC plus as I call it, um, even uh, despite the traditional contraindications like proximal capitate or lunate fossa disease, and that SC fusion is clearly the inferior choice. So uh, like we've discussed, there are a number of studies that look at the long-term follow-up of PRC. There are a lot of studies that look at uh, PRC versus four-corner fusion, um, and we don't have time to go into all of these, but uh, I'll just give you the cliff notes. PRC is, it's a good procedure. I think uh, patients do very well, they're very satisfied. They're able to maintain a good motion arc, uh, about 70, 80 degrees or 50% of the other side. Uh, they have very reasonable grip, about 70 to 80% of the other side. And if you look at studies that compare it with limited risk fusion procedures, the results are comparable. But in PRC, we don't have the risks of non-union and hardware complications. There is a progression of radiocarpal arthrosis, uh, but it doesn't seem to be symptomatic and patients tend not to have to go on to risk fusion. What about in Keenbox? Uh, patients do well. Uh, pain, pain improves, motion and grip strength improve, actually uh, maybe better than we see in all comers. And 92% uh, of the patients in this study were satisfied. This was a study out of uh, the Mayo Clinic that uh, looked at patients who had a PRC and Keenbox was actually a predictor of better outcomes. So the 33 patients that had uh, PRC for Keenbox had a better dash and a lower rate of revision. So it sounds pretty good. What are the disadvantages? People talk about uh, loss of carpal height, which uh, theoretically can decrease strength, but in all the studies that compare this with a four corner fusion, which presumably preserves height, there hasn't been a difference shown in grip strength. Um, and I think the most common one people talk about, as Anthony talked about, is um, the radiocapitate arthrosis, um, which invariably happens with time uh, because there's a size mismatch between the capitate and the lunate fossa and capitate slides a little instead of bending like it should. Um, but this hasn't been shown to correlate with any symptoms or functional outcomes. Um, everybody always says that if there's wear on the proximal capitate or the lunate fossa that we can't do a PRC and we have to come up with something else. And that was Anthony's main argument. But I'm going to tell you why that doesn't uh, hold true anymore and we can basically ignore that a recommendation from earlier times. We have a lot of good tools now to get around this problem. Um, a lot of them involve interposing something in the defect and some involve resurfacing the capitate. So uh, Dr. Eaton showed us the capsular flap, uh, dorsal capsular interposition back in the late 90s. This is a distally based flap that is raised and uh, after completing the PRC, it's placed into the defect between the capitate and the lunate fossa and sutured to the volar capsule. Um, you can also do this uh, the other way as a proximally based flap uh, and, and interpose it the same way. We looked at 25 patients who had this done and they all had degeneration of the capitate or the lunate fossa or both um, and compared them with people who had a standard PRC, um, followed them out six years and both groups did really well. 92% were satisfied. There was a pretty low rate of uh, radiocapitate arthrosis. Um, and so I think the takeaway from this study is that even in the face of wearing of the capitate or lunate fossa, if you do an interposition, you can get comparable outcomes. Um, so we can expand the indications of PRC beyond what we've been traditionally taught. Um, there are other options for interposition. This was uh, published by my buddy and co-fellow, Remy Rabinovich. This is a dermal allograft uh, that's interposed into the capsule, uh, into the uh, defect the same way. Um, we don't have long-term outcomes on this, but at up to five years, there was essentially no progression of radiocapitate arthrosis with this technique. Um, for resurfacing of the capitate, uh, Dr. Imbriglia showed us this uh, oats to the uh, 
capitate from the excised lunate. Um, and for larger, uh, for larger defects of the capitate, uh, we have pyrocarbon and other implants that resurface the, the proximal capitate. And again, people have shown that if you do one of these resurfacing arthroplasties, you can get comparable results despite higher grade of arthritis in these patients. So what about SC fusion? Uh, Anthony brought this study up. I don't want to belabor it, but let me just mention a couple of things. A quarter of these patients either didn't get better or got worse. The Mayo risk scores were not great. Um, and then carpal height, which is a presumed benefit of doing an SC fusion, actually decreased. And arthrosis progressed in 40% of patients. Um, and 19% had subsequent surgery. So this is no miracle whip. And if we put this head to head with the dorsal capsular interposition, um, both patients had progressive arthrosis. I think we can't really statistically compare those, but what, what we can say is that 19% of the patients who had a fusion had to have a secondary surgery, which may be the most important outcome. So if you look at all these studies of SC fusion and PRC, I'd say pain relief is equivalent at best. Motion and grip strength, we can call it equivalent. It's certainly not better for a fusion. But there's complications. There's non-unions in all of these studies after you do an SC fusion. And as we mentioned, there is a progression of radioscaphoid arthrosis, even with an SC fusion, which is to say that any time that we alter the carpal kinematics, uh, which we're doing with either one of these procedures, and if we do it in a patient young enough or let the risk go on long enough, it's probably going to degrade. And in this study, most patients at 10 years out or more had some sort of arthrosis. And in fact, one of them was revised to a PRC with resurfacing. So even in younger patients, when you may say proximal carpectomy is, is not indicated and quote this study, I, I don't think SC fusion is necessarily the answer either. So why do I think we should do a PRC? I think it's reliable. Patients have good pain relief and they're satisfied. The motion and strength are really comparable to any other motion preserving a salvage procedure. No risk of non-union. And interposition can really help us to expand the indications of this beyond what we traditionally thought. And in fact, though we haven't shown this, maybe it can reduce radiocapitate degeneration in the long term. Why not SC fusion? The outcomes are clearly no better than PRC. There's more complications. And so I just don't see the point. All of the arguments that were brought up, the wearing, I don't think that's a contraindication anymore. We're kind of beating a dead horse with this long term. The arthrosis rate is, is going to happen in both, and maybe with the interposition, we can even uh, tackle this a little better. And in a younger patient, I think both can fail. So uh, what happens if it does fail? With a PRC, I think the revision is a little bit more straightforward. We could even do another interposition, but even if we bail out to a total wrist fusion, we don't have to take down a fusion, we don't have to take out hardware, smiles and high fives, and we're out of the OR. But if we do an SC fusion, it's a different story. We have to take out hardware. We have to take down a fusion. We probably have to resurface the capitate if we're going to try and do a motion preserving salvage or we do a total risk fusion. So for the cases that uh, Dr. Gaston mentioned, I'd say for a 70 year old, obviously PRC. I think everyone would agree with that. 50 year old, same story. For the 25 year old laborer, I think maybe this is a reasonable point of debate, but I would argue that um, there, you know, no one has shown me that there's a significant difference in grip strength no matter what we do. I think either of the procedures, if we put it in this 25-year-old guy, is probably going to degrade with time. If he's lucky, he's not symptomatic. If he's unlucky, I think I'd rather revise the PRC. But ultimately, maybe neither of these is the right choice for this, this guy. That's all I got. Thank you. Uh, thanks to my mentor. Shout out to my co-fellows. And uh, would love to hear what the faculty have to say. Great presentations times two for sure. Um, Peter, a couple quick questions on SA fusions for us. You showed a couple pictures where the lunate was in and somewhere it was out. Do you leave the lunate and remove the lunate? How often? Sometimes, never, always. And if radioscaphoid arthritis is a problem, should we be doing concomitant radial styloidectomy with these or not? Yeah, um, uh, I think the two guys did an awesome job. Thank you. Um, I think that for the lunate, that, that's always the question if you're going to fuse, uh, do an SC fusion, if you leave it or not. And I think looking at at least our history here, we found that if you do a lunate, uh, subtotal uh, lunate excision, they may get a little more ulnar translocation, although it doesn't seem to be clinically significant. And so um, I think that it's okay to leave as long as there's not, you know, that coronal shear fraction of lunate is not going to be unstable. Um, and 
There's not significant arthritis where um, even despite restoring your carpal height, you feel like there's still going to be some painful articulation there. So usually I try to retain it and I tell the patient that and then I say if it still hurts down the road, then we may have to take your lunate out. There's only been a handful of times that uh, I've actually take, felt like the lunate had to come out at the time of the index surgery. And so for me, my algorithm is um, don't take it out unless the fracture fragments or the lunate so fragmented and I feel like it's going to cause residual pain. Because that's, I think no matter what you do, PRC or SC fusion, it's it's really for, for pain management and um, helping with their function. So um, that's what I would do uh, in terms of the lunate. Okay. Yeah, another question too. <laughs> Go ahead. I was just wondering about radial styloidectomy. Do you add that to it? Because you know the first spot they're going to get degenerative changes at the radial styloid scaphoid interface. Do you just do it prophylactically or wait for them to get changes? No, I don't because um, uh, I think it's a very good point. And like Vinny said, you know, whichever you choose, PRC or SC uh, fusion, you're going to get um, progressive arthritis. It may not be significant on the road or lead to any any problems or salvage, um, but I typically don't because I realize the RSC is pretty important um, to give coronal plane stability to the carpus or what's remaining. Um, and I hate to just take the styloid tip off prophylactically and then somehow render the RSC origin incompetent. And so I typically don't. And Lee, you guys blended in a bunch of stuff there. There was PRC with interposition. There was uh, arthroplasties, resurfacing. You had it all going on, even allografts. So what are you doing when, Lee? Yeah. When does someone need their capitate head replaced? When do they just need the capsule? What's the algorithm in Philly? Well, there's not a, there's not a good algorithm, and that's the problem. We really don't know. And most of the interposition or PRC plus techniques uh, really only have track records with exceptional capsule interposition that are five years. Generally, uh, if the capitate has less than three millimeters of spots of deterioration, um, there won't be anything, though capsular interposition has always done a little bit, even in uh, straightforward patients. Um, so in the younger patient is when, for example, the 40-year-old, I, I don't do either of these, I know we were given two choices, but I don't do either of these in the, in the young patient under 35. Um, I don't think either of them work, and I tend to go to uh, non-salvage procedures in those and see how they do and let them ride out the decades until they need something else done. I don't think either procedure is terrifically good, even with thinner position. But for the older patient, I think that uh, for me, it's a no-brainer. I've gotten away, with the exception of the four quad fusion uh, in slack wrist three, I pretty much have gotten away from any kind of fusions uh, in the wrist. They're isolated fusions. Well, that brings me to one of the, you, you touched on the next question I was going to ask both of you and Peter and anybody else that wants uh, to chime yeah. in. And 3B Keenbox, uh, what's the role for you for non salvage procedures such as shortening, MFT, or the old grainer <laughs> procedure? Peter, you want to tackle it first? Yeah, sure. Um, I think in a, in a 3B uh, Keenbox where you have carpal collapse, um, and then a fragmenting, collapsing uh, lunate. Um, I guess in my algorithm, it's it's either a um, scaph uh, SC fusion or um, I know it's I know we're trying to debate um, saying PR. I'm supposed to say PRC is not the answer ever, but I, I agree with Dr. Osterman that um, you know, I think it's just treating the patient. In some patients, it is a no-brainer. It's, it's I think it's a it's a good option, but I think for a three B. Um, it, I, it would be one of those two, and I wouldn't do, um, I know that uh, Jim, I don't know if he's on, he has some really innovative ways of reconstructing uh, the articular service, uh, surface, but for me, um, uh, it's just, it's, uh, it's, it's not an uh, option for me. Lee, what about shortening, grainer, or MFT? Any roles? Uh, yeah, yeah, I believe if, if you have a capitate that you could basically, I mean, a lunate you can basically salvage, that may be a vascularized graph for me. One of the things that we've added to that is we put a, a, a Doug Handel type bridge plate on and leave it on for four months to allow revascularization to occur. Uh, for younger patients uh, who, I, who let's say they are a 3B, I tend to believe it or not do a wrist arthroscopy, a denervation and drilling of the distal radius. No plates, no shortening in any real sense. 
unless they're more than three millimeters negative on the variance. I think those are fair. I want to show you guys just real quick, some other just real quick ones, just as options of what would people think about these. Can you, um, can you share me, Jerry, to where I can click? There we go. This is one of Jesse's cases. I lost a debate to Jesse at Philadelphia Hand Center about two or three years ago. And this was the case I lost it on. So I had to just steal his case and show it to y'all. Uh, the Grainer procedure. Here's a classic 3B case of Jesse's. He goes in, lengthens this uh, capitate head, interposes a graft, fixes it. Here he is. Here's your follow-up. That was four years. And here's eight-year follow-up on the patient. So... We need to consider going back to the well for some old procedures. Would this avoid some of the complications of SC fusion, Peter, uh, that you showed? And there's a the guy's final follow-ups. Uh, just another case of his, just to highlight. And here's one more I'll throw out there and get opinions on. This is a 17-year-old I personally treated two years ago. Dominant wrist, she plays in the band. She failed casting and everything else. Uh, she's got that coronal split. And she just gets a radial shortening with scope and debridement and she's two years out and hanging in there. So, you know, the Wash U group, if anybody from Wash U on here, look, they've published on the fact that uh, radial shortening doesn't seem to have limits. 3B is still okay. Any of y'all are on here, chime in, or Lee or Peter. Your thoughts on radial shortening even in 3B and in coronal split lunates? You, you quote, haven't burned any bridges. I'll yeah, still do radial short. I'm sorry. I'll no, shut up. I still do radial <laughs> shortening, but I think that we're getting to the point you don't really have to radial shorten a lot. And I've gone to the point, as I said, of just drilling the distal radius, which is an old time procedure, and which, at least in our early studies that we've been looking at at five years, we can tell no difference uh, from stage two to stage three B keen box, whether you shorten it with a plate or whether you drilled it like you were closing down the epiphysis. Yeah, and I uh, I think that with the 3B, I think the cat's out of the bag. So trying to do a joint leveling or the Illumarendi, you know, uh, cordy compression to try to resuscitate the lunate, logically it doesn't make sense to me. But, you know, maybe it's just a denervation like Dr. Osterman said. It's, uh, you know, patients may have progression of their keen box, and, um, but they still do okay. Uh, so... Maybe there's more to it. Maybe we're over, over overthinking it at times too. I think uh, maybe Glenn, if I could just make a comment, I think to all the residents and fellows out there, I think wherever you train, you're going to drink whatever Kool-Aid they're going to tell you. Cause I admittedly am a, a limited risk fusion type of person. And I, and I pretty rarely do PRCs unless the patient is indicated for them. And you may be at an institution where PRC is the first line for everything. I think in the end, it's um, as long as I think you you factor in the patient's uh, you know comorbidities and what they want out of their wrist. Um, I think either is a good option because either has pros and cons to it. Yeah, and I trained in uh, Indy with Jeff, and he's on here. Jeff, uh, anything changed in Indy, or what what are you doing now with these patients? No, I don't. I don't really have. Uh, I don't think anything's. Uh, changed Glenn since you've been here but um, we, we don't we certainly don't see a lot of scapal capitate fusions at our place uh, and even though I'm a I'm a limited intercarpal guy like uh, like Peter but I mean I'm, I'm more along the, um, the lines of there if they're 3d and we're looking at a potential salvage that doing something that really doesn't burn any bridges and I've I've gone to a uh, modified Illuramendi um, uh, type of procedure as well um, for uh, uh, radial shortening. And um, it, it's really, it's, it's really interesting to see how many of those patients that even though, you know, their radiographs look, look um, pretty uh, broken down that clinically they actually do pretty well. So I have Before a few, I few that are really long-term as well, you know, with, with rotten looking x-rays, but still have good clinical function and good pain relief. Before we pass the torch to the next group, we'll do a final one. I know we've got Milan and uh, Mark Richards on the phone, so two two micro heavy centers. Uh, any any regional variations there for you two? No, I I agree with uh, Lee Osterman. You know that's my approach uh, for the three B or uh, drilling and shortening if it is uh, more than three millimeters uh, uh, shortening of the ulna. Yeah, Mark, you want to chime in at the end? Yes. I, I, the I, hair, I, too, I, man. What's that? The hair has gotten long. 
Uh, his hat had actually operated today. <laughs> no barber. I might drive to Georgia and get a haircut. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no micro wisdom for the three Bs. Uh, I, I do like uh, one comment before we go to metacarpal. Uh, I do like, there's starting to be a couple papers on the uh, vascularized bone graft to lunate with a bridge plate, like uh, Lee was talking about. And, and we've had some good luck with that in the two and the three A's, uh, but have not been doing it for three B's. And, and I like scoping first and seeing what the joint surfaces look like. I, I think Greg Bain's addition to that classification system is really helpful for me. So my two cents. Great. All right, Jerry, I'll turn it over to the next team. Thanks, Glenn. Hey, Jeff, you're up. I like your hair there, Steph. <laughs> oh, yeah. My daughter's getting out the hair dye. Can you guys hear Jeff okay? Or is I think you're on mute right now. Me too. Can you hear me now? There you go. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to introduce the topic of metacarpal fractures with two cases. So the first is a 17-year-old uh, male who was injured playing hockey. He presents with a closed small finger metacarpal fracture. No zebras here, just very typical. Has fracture site tenderness, deformity, which includes the loss of the prominence of the metacarpal head fullness on the volar aspect of his uh, hand, loss of full extension, but a significant malrotation with a crossover deformity with flexion. And here you see he's got, um, you know, kind of a, uh, almost a shaft fracture, a distal shaft fracture with a significant amount of angu volar angulation as well as rotation, which can be picked up clinically. And then we'll move to the second case a 50-year-old female who's in a high-speed motor vehicle accident. We were actually asked to take care of her after she was already asleep in the operating room because she had uh, associated orthopedic injuries. They didn't realize she had a hand injury till they got her in the OR. She has deformity, closed injuries. We don't know anything about range of motion or sensation as a normal vascular exam. And she has this, this uh, uh, x-ray which shows these more, more distal, not really shaft fractures, which we're covering, but um, has multiple uh, metacarpal fractures uh, in uh, isolated hand. And here you see significant angulation. Um, so, so we have uh, three teams that are going to debate um, metacarpals. We have metacarpal plating presented by uh, Dr. Hess with the mentor Mark Richard from Duke, Bouquet Pinning from USC, Dr. Wilton. Uh, his mentor is Milan Savanovic. And then intramedullary screw fixation, Dr. Maslow uh, with Glenn Gaston, um, his mentor from Ortho Carolina. Thank you for being a friend. Travels on the phone. So, move it on. Why doesn't you take over first? Somebody mute their audio that's singing. <laughs> All right. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Let me. Uh... All right. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Thanks. Uh, I think someone. Can everyone hear that singing? Or is that just that me? No, I hear it too. Okay. I'll just I'll, I'll soldier through. Okay. Dan, Thanks, are you able to share a screen there, Dan? I think you're not on share screen quite yet. Sorry? Uh, if you could share your screen, your PowerPoint's not up quite yet. You just the share screen button on your Zoom. Yeah. Jenny. 
Yep. Is this hacking uh, on our cyber hacking? I don't think so, but I I can't really. Uh oh. Sorry. Uh, hey Jerry, you can uh, you can mute everyone if you go to participants, and then the speakers can uh, <laughs> unmute themselves again. All right. Sorry, my, my my jazz singing isn't isn't very good. Let me see how to do this here. Um, yeah, something's going on here. We keep coming in and out. Uh, let me go ahead and mute all right now. And then I'm going to go ahead and put Dan on. All right, Dan, let me fit, if I could put you back alive now. Does that show my slideshow? Or is that the presentation? Yeah, you're good. You're good. You're good. Well, okay. All right. Okay. So, hi, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to provide our point of view in this virtual arena. My name is Dan Hess. Uh, one of the fellows at Duke, and I want to thank Mike Malone and Mark Richard for their help with this presentation. So metacarpal fractures are a common problem in upper extremity trauma and most often seen on the ulnar digits. These are typically injuries of aggression, which may spell trouble when considering patient compliance with a treatment or rehab protocol. And these certainly aren't benign injuries without repercussions if treated improperly. It's been said that patients lose about seven degrees of flexion with every two millimeters of shortening of the metacarpal and just five degrees of malrotation can lead to 1.5 centimeters of digital overlap, so it's important we get it right. And there are a number of surgical treatment methods, and you'll hear about a few of them today, so I won't belabor the point. Um, so when should you use a plate? Uh, there's a lot of positives about plating. First off, plating, typically done from a dorsal approach, provides stable fixation on the tension side of the fracture, which we all know is technically preferred. Uh, this stable fixation is especially important in patients that need to get back to their job or work sooner. Um, or sport sooner. And with all the various plate designs, I think it'd be hard to argue that there is a more versatile approach. And plates can be used for essentially any fracture type, including ones with bone loss or articular involvement. Um, there's no need for a secondary procedure. Uh, there should not be any concern about placing plates and screws in the setting of an open injury, as that has not been shown to increase complications. And finally, I think a lot has been made about complication rate with plating, especially with extensor tendon pathology, but I would offer that much of that data is based on older plate designs. Newer studies looking at currently available low profile plates really show very minimal uh, complication rates. Uh, here's a relatively straightforward case, 34 year old male, punched someone in the face, par for the course, and sustained this fourth metacarpal shaft fracture. Uh, possibly if you kind of looking at the x-rays, maybe a little foreshortened on the PA, a little bit of comminution. Um, hard to tell if there's a separate butterfly fragment there. Uh, and get sense on the oblique view that maybe there's a little bit of, of malrotation. Um, and we have that characteristic apex dorsal deformity on the lateral view. So we chose to plate this fracture, use a separate uh, lag screw with a low profile plate placed over the top as a neutralization construct. Um, we obtained excellent reduction with the plate counteracting the deforming forces and was able to interpose some tissue between the plate and extensor tendons upon closure, which is certainly always helpful. It's hard to argue uh, with the range of motion, clinical appearance, and outcome on this final follow-up pictures. Uh, so what does the literature say? So traditional studies have reported higher complication rates uh, for plating, with stiffness being the primary concern. Um, but a closer look shows that many of these studies may not be entirely generalizable to metacarpal shaft fractures as we deal with them today. So all these studies use older plating systems and a lot of them included a substantial amount of high energy injuries, which you can certainly use plates for, but that's not the topic of today's debate. And um, you know, looking at those pictures, I, I doubt very much that the, the plates are the sole reason for those digits to be stiff. Uh, today, plating systems um, for metacarpal fractures um, are shown here. So in addition to having the use of very small screws with locking options, um, they're very narrow and low profile. The thickness of the plates range from 0.6 to 1.5 millimeters across these four major implant companies. And so, well, if that's true, you, you know, you may ask, uh, why are there recent reports of bad outcomes with metacarpal fractures? So this recent study um, in JHS, uh, Dr. Malamed uh, in JHS Asia did a meta-analysis supporting pins over plate and screw constructs. 
Um, but let's, let's take a deeper look at this. It only included five studies. Um, and a closer look showed that two of those studies were for metacarpal neck fractures, not the topic of today's debate. And another one of those studies combined the metacarpal and phalanx fractures. Um, and a fourth study actually included only four plates in the comparison. So the only remaining study, uh, that of Ozer, published in JHS in 2008, actually supports plate fixation of metacarpal fractures. These authors reported good dash uh, reduction, good total active motion, and union comparable to the IM nailing technique that they were studying uh, with better maintenance of reduction and less removal of hardware. Uh, Mark Exotic's group at Duke is currently working to publish our experience with metacarpal uh, plating. And we've had good outcomes using various low profile plates. In 110 fractures, we only had a 5% major complication rate as defined by Page's study, who if you remember, reported a 20% complication rate. Um, we experienced no tendon ruptures and only one patient underwent removal of hardware for prominent implants. And we're not alone. Very recently, HUD et al. also demonstrated excellent outcomes with metacarpal plating, where at 23 months, range of motion was nearly full. So what are the secret, secrets to success? Um, it's important in these fractures to carefully dissect the soft tissues to preserve periosteum such that after placement of a low profile implant, you can suture the periosteum back over the top. Uh, this allows for early mobilization with minimal risk of tendon adhesions. And one must remember that the tendons don't actually span the entirety of the metacarpals, but run obliquely to them. And we should also mention that uh, we did an exhaustive literature research and revealed that plates don't pose a risk to the articular cartilage of the metacarpal head, unlike their intramedullary counterparts. So first, do no harm. So in summary, uh, Although complications, especially stiffness, have been reported upon, it's unlikely these older reports are truly generalizable to newer implants and techniques. Moreover, a closer look at much of the literature shows that plates are actually probably getting a bad rap, especially for metacarpal shaft fractures. The plate really has many advantages, including robust fixation, direct visualization, allowing anatomic reduction, and minimal malrotation. It, unlike intermedullary fixation, does not penetrate the articular cartilage. There are no pin sites, of course, so pin site infections are not a factor. They allow for early activity in return to sport. And as with all procedures, proper technique is key. So for metacarpal plating, that involves using a low profile plate that is covered with periosteum to prevent adhesions and stiffness. Thank you. And actually, this is a patient that Dr. Richard saw in clinic this last week and actually had to include it, but maybe, uh, the tattoo is so pretty, maybe we'd argue against the big dorsal incision here, but, but pretty nice. That's all I got. Okay, let's, let's move on. Let's uh, go to um, the West Coast, to the USC group. Go ahead and unmute too. Un unmuted, uh, Peter. Peter, is your mic working? It should be unmuted right now for you as well. Yeah, are you guys able to hear me? Yep, there we go. I hear you now, yeah. Okay, great. Sorry, I had the headphones in. Uh, thanks, Dr. Greenberg, um, and greetings from sunny LA. I'm Peter, and uh, my mentor is Dr. Milan Stavanovich. So I'm tasked with defending intramedullary K wires for metacarpal fractures, but I really want to advocate um, just in, in for K wires in general. Um, first off, it was a great presentation from Dan at Duke, and I have a lot of respect for Duke. The Duke lineage um, has provided me with several mentors of my own. As you can see here, Dr. Harry Meisel, Dr. Luke Nicholson, and of course my mentor here, Dr. Milan Stavanovich. So I want to start by saying that. <coughs> Peel of plates, um, especially as an orthopedic surgeon, they're a lot like a fancy new sports car. They're flashy, they're expensive, but ultimately uh, they're an unnecessary luxury. We all know that all you need is a wire driver and some K wires, which is a lot like the family station wagon. Um, is it luxurious and flashy? Maybe not. Is it a cost effective machine that's going to get the job done? Absolutely. So this was a patient that we were refer was referred to us 
Uh, he was treated by two separate surgeons who were obviously interested in making a sexy x-ray. He was a 23-year-old mo professional motocross rider who came to, to our clinic after two separate failed ORAFs of a fifth metacarpal shaft fracture. His first plate broke and he came to us six months after with continued pain. We decided to treat him uh, after removing an, uh, his plate and debriding the non-union site with transverse K-wires to hold our length and rotation. And as you can see from his final post-op visit, um, he opened in perfectly and he had extra motion. Uh, excellent motion. Uh, so while I am here to defend the surgical technique for fixing metacarpal fractures, I have to preface this by saying that like most of the faculty here and most of the fellows, we work at a busy level one trauma center that sees over 150,000 emergency visits a year and we encounter hundreds of metacarpal fractures. OR time is certainly a hot commodity and we operate on a very, very small percentage of these. The question is, do these really need surgery? And as we know, there's not really a consensus on how to treat these injuries. We know that most uncomplicated neck and shaft fractures can have great outcomes without surgery and even without a good reduction or rigid immobilization. Follow-up, again, um, because these heal so well, has led many to recommend no follow-up at all, certainly for the uh, uncomplicated fracture. However, we know uh, that not all metacarpal fractures are treated equal and that there are fracture characteristics that guide our decision-making. Um, currently, you know, those factors include um, whether or not they're open or have concurrent soft tissue injuries, the location and pattern of the fracture, as well as the amount of angulation and shortening, and what I think most importantly is the rotation of the involved tissue. Um, accepted treatment options, as we heard from our colleagues at Duke, I would be ORIF, and we'll hear shortly, I am screws, and then I want to advocate for K-wires. So why K-wires? Well, I've always tried to live by the KISS mantra. Placing K-wires is a skill that every hand surgeon should be comfortable with. It requires less time in the OR, less soft tissue stripping, and less, theoretically less stiffness due to adhesions. I'm also a big proponent of not leaving any hardware in the hand. As we know, the soft tissue envelope is very thin, fairly thin and unforgiving. <clears throat> implant fractures can be a pretty difficult problem. Also in the era of cost-conscious medical decision-making, you can't get any cheaper than a couple of K-wires. And importantly, you can expect very good outcomes with K-wires and few complications. So in 1995, Boucher et al. published his series, um, or Dr. Boucher published his series, utilizing a technique of flexible intramedullary pinning that he had already been doing for about 20 years. He described making a small incision over the base of the fifth metacarpal to identify and protect any dorsal sensory branches of the ulnar nerve, then using an awl to perforate the cortex on the ulnar aspect of the base. He then used three blunt-ended 0.8 millimeter K-wires, um, which were pre-bent uh, and sent through the intramedullary canal. He then reduced the fracture with the jaws maneuver, and then the pins were introduced past the fracture site in a divergent fashion so that they resemble a flower bouquet. The wires are then cut with enough length to allow for later removal, and immediate uh, active motion is allowed. Uh, his technical pearls were just to make sure that you're using blunt-ended tip, um, blunt-ended wires, because sharp wires will inevitably catch the cortex and not progress through the, the diaphysis, and that your starting point should be at the lateral base of the metacarpal, because two dorsal of a starting point can cause extensor pending impingement. I want to thank Dr. Francis Sharp for this case. This is a 39-year-old female who tripped over a dog and presented with this oblique fifth metacarpal shaft fracture with 100% displacement and malrotation noted on examination. Here you can see the three K-wires, which are introduced, introduced from the lateral base of the fifth metacarpal, and then the divergence of the blunt ends in the metacarpal head. And after hardware removal, you can see it healed very nicely. Um, I think that you can really pick and choose your literature on metacarpal shaft fractures. This was a, a very recent study um, out of Korea comparing lock plating and bouquet fixation in a series of 75 patients. Um, 36 patients were treated with anti-grade K-wires. Um, they actually left theirs exposed over the skin and 33 patients were treated with a low-grade, uh, low-profile locking plate. Both groups were actually spinned for two weeks and then allowed uh, motion afterwards, and the K-wires removed in six weeks. So they initially found no difference in pain scores. Um, the range of motion was actually better in the K-wire group initially. Um, however, 14 of the 33 patients with plates ultimately required a second operation to remove the hardware for a variety of reasons. Um, after uh, tenolysis and hardware removal, their NP motion was better in the K-wire group. Uh, so, even for uh, just the final case showing that even with multiple metacarpal fractures as seen in this amputation, we think K-wires are still the optimal choice. They can be placed in the amputated part before the patient goes to the OR and sent retrograde to fix the bone in less than five minutes, leaving more time to work on tendons and the micro work. Uh, here we used 2.062 K-wires for each metacarpal with ultimately a pretty good result um, for the initial injury, considering that initial injury. Thank you very much.
Okay, and I, that, was, that was a nice presentation, Peter. Let's um, wrap it up with the uh, Ortho Carolina group from Charlotte. All right, can everybody hear me? Yep. Yep. All right. So thanks Dr. Greenberg, Dr. Wong for organizing this and for including us. Uh, thanks Dr. Gaston for being my mentor. Uh, I'm gonna discuss intramedullary screw fixation for metacarpal fractures. And uh, Dr. Greenberg, I'm sorry, this is the first time I'm seeing these cases, but uh, if both uh, cases were going on to operative treatment, they would definitely get screwed um, uh, here at North Carolina. And just as a disclaimer, please don't actually search this hashtag here. Uh, we don't own it. I can't be responsible for what comes up. Jed, share your screen. Jed, share, share your screen, Jed. We're, we're not seeing your screen. All right. Let's see here. How about now? There you go. Go back. Yeah, you're good now. All right. Are we cooking? That's on. <laughs> All right. So to take a step back, uh, the treatment of long bone fractures in orthopedic surgery is widely accepted to be intramedullary fixation. Uh, IM fixation confers several advantages. It's limited soft tissue dissection, early weight bearing, and easy rehab. Uh, so treatment of a long bone fracture, even if the bone is small, should strongly consider intramedullary fixation. The IM screw for metacarpal fracture fixation was initially described with a three millimeter cannula to headless screw back in 2010. And soon thereafter, the safety of the technique was confirmed with a 3D CT analysis. Our technique is similar, utilizing a small incision over the metacarpal head and splitting or mobilizing the extended tendons. Under fluoro, the guide wire is inserted into the dorsal third of the central metacarpal head in line with the shaft. And our typical implants are shown here, uh, matching the diameters of most metacarpals, uh, with a relatively consistent pitch for controlled compression during insertion. Uh, it's important to control and check for rotation during insertion as these screws can tend to get a rather substantial bite. And iron screws have several advantages over the other forms of fixation. One is the variety of fractures that we can treat with it. It's much easier to ask what can't we treat with an iron screw. Uh, we can fix simple fractures, we can fix proximal fractures, we can fix multiple fractures, and we can fix multiple different sizes of metacarpals. We can fix non union is in the case in the top left where revisions with uh, ion screw fixation achieve union. Or we can use ion screws for transposition of the index ray after a traumatic long ray resection. Additionally, Dr. Wong just recently published integrated metacarpal ion screw fixation as a nice alternative uh, that can be ideal for proximal third fractures. So in recent literature, uh, ion screws have tended to outperform other fixation options with the exception of biomechanical strength. A plate and screw fixation construct clearly offers the most biomechanical stability, um, but it is the most invasive and it shows. So reported infection rates in some series is as high as 24%. K wires also carry a significant infection risk, especially if left exposed. And in contrast, infection after an IM screw placement is so rare that in a few clinical uh, series reported, none have reported a deep infection. IM screws have consistently shown a high total arc of motion, grip strength, uh, that is at least as strong, if not stronger, than the other methods. And furthermore, hardware removal is relatively rare uh, and has only been described after asymptomatic hardware migration uh, or fracture after repeated trauma, i.e. the patient punched something again. Another significant advantage is the early motion allowable. This is uh, in the PACU immediately post-op where we allow patients to do active range of motion in a bulky soft dressing. The disadvantages of IM screws are few. Insertion of the screw does leave an articular surface defect, uh, but we would claim that it's not functionally limiting. The top left picture is from the initial 3D CT study, uh, showing that the ideal insertion site only contacts the proximal phalanx with MP joint hyperextension. So these pi are pictures of what it looks like in real life or actually in a cadaver, but the blue mark is the ideal starting point. On the right is the MP joint flexed to 90 degrees, no contact. 20 degrees of flexion, no contact. The bottom right, at 20 degrees of hyperextension, you first start to see contact, but this is not only a common position that our MP joint is not in, uh, nor is it functional. Cost of the implant has been brought up too. Uh, I reached out to our local vendors and was quoted that the average cost for an IM screw kit is around $1,000. Uh, take this in, con in um, contrast to the combined cost of lock plating, uh, which is actually more and takes additional time in the OR. 
So the reported cost times for screws likely fall somewhere in the middle. Uh, although there is some recent data showing promising outcomes of iron screw fixation under Walnut with minimal complications and a quick return to work. While we use this method for uh, many different types of metacarpal fractures here, uh, not all are amenable to screw fixation and some exceptions are shown here. In summary, while the IM screw literature is smaller and early than for other fixation methods, it's consistently favorable. So increased stability with lost tissue, less soft tissue disruption leads to fewer complications and allows for early active motion. Um, as a result, it's become our preferred fixation strategy for a majority of operative metacarpal fractures. Thank you. Great, that was uh, uh, three excellent presentations. So, um, you know, the, um, I, I mean, we see the we see these metacarpal fractures um, all the time. We see them. They have all different personalities. They're attached to all different patients. We have to have a, a variety of uh, treatment options in our bag. If, if if I could at this time, I want the the mentors to go around and just um, uh, granted you presented one technique, but just kind of maybe in you know a minute or two minutes, kind of go through your thought process and algorithm for. Um, for, for treating these injuries. So why don't, um, uh, let's start with you, Mark. Good. Thanks, Jeff, and, and great job, guys. That was a, a very balanced presentation of everything and, and I think really well done. So hats off to you, Glenn's hat off to you. Um, the, uh, the, I think what's, uh, what is, I'll answer the question first. It, all things being equal, all things available, if it was my hand, uh, I would have the intramedullary screw all things being equal. I've been very impressed with the results. Uh, and I, I think you're exactly right. Personality of the fracture, personality of the patient has to be matched with all these. And, and I think that the two learning points here are defending plates. I think the literature is not fair to plates because it's not the current plates we have available. Uh, so let's, uh, we gotta be fair about, I was making sure everybody could hear me. Uh, we gotta be fair about evaluating complications from plates. For, uh, for what we have available today. And if you do it with a thoughtful technique and plate is the right answer, I think you can get a great outcome. So don't throw that away just because it's bigger and bulkier uh, and has some track record of some complications in the literature. Um, K wires are not without, constant, uh, uh, without complications, but I, I think that the important thing here is that we all know that fractures are soft tissue injuries that just happen to have a broken bone in them. And you have to pay attention to those components as well. All three of these techniques are within all of our potential for bag of tricks. We talked the first week about grass from the rib or MFTs. That's getting a little bit peripheral for some people. Everybody should be able to do all of these and apply them in the right situation, the right clinical setting. So I think this is a much more even-handed discussion worth knowing all of them and thinking about the composite of the patient, the personality of them. But to answer your question, if it was all things being equal, I would take a screw for my metacarpal. Uh, Dr. Stevanovic. Okay, I have been uh, 27 years now at uh, USC, and uh, you can imagine uh, <clears throat> the potential of the cases that we see there, probably two, 300 metacarpal fractures a year, and probably 98% of them I never operated. I let them to uh, heal probably mal united, and later on the breed uh, dorsal side, the patient complained for aesthetics, but nothing else. So two uh, reasons only to operate is one, if you have a severe telescopic shortening, and the second one, if you have a crossing uh, uh, scissoring of the fingers. So that's a, a two. It will be so expensive for a county to pay probably three, 400 screws a year, which will be about half a million dollars probably, and uh, plates. I am not telling that we cannot fix that with them. I think we do any <clears throat> for, uh, so many years I have been calling a court to testify uh, against, uh, you know, try to support the patient. Uh, I never testified against the doctor, so on, uh, and it was only complications for the plate and screws. And I agree with Mark, we have uh, now different plates and different size of the screws. But my approach to this, don't operate, uh, especially <clears throat> if you have ability to put a splint and have a complying patients and uh, try to see patient for six weeks and after that is uh, tell the patient don't need to come anymore. Great. 
Thank you very much. Um, and then uh, Glenn, and Glenn, in, in addition to you, to you kind of addressing this, I want you to justify something that, uh, that uh, Jed presented on his slide of a, a nearly $2,000 cost for K-wires. Where, where did that fake news come from? I don't know, Jed, I'm assuming that includes the anesthesiology in the room and everything else that's total cost of case, not the cost of the actual K-wire. Okay, um, yes, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. so I think it's the cost of the total case cost there, Jeff, not just the implant. It was actually the total cost of care. It included post-op follow-ups and rehab and uh, OTPT. Okay, very good. Thank you. Well, go it, ahead. Should have, it should have included the things Tom Fisher taught me, Jeff, when I was at Indy, that K-wires first penetrate, then they incinerate, then they irritate, and then they separate. So Tom taught me that and I've remembered it to this day. So uh, with that in mind, uh, what is my true algorithm? Uh, really, I do think I am screws have been a game changer, but I agree with Milan. I think undeniably the majority of metacarpal fractures can be managed close. Um, I would add one to the things you described. You said telescopic shortening and scissoring. I think there's also the very real thing that a lot of people need things fixed just to get back to life sooner. I think very few of us would take six weeks out of our schedule to be in a cast. You've got athletes that try to return to sport. You've got dentists, you've got people who have lives that they don't want to be tied up in a cast and immobilized for that period of time. And that's, that is one of the reasons I do fix some of these, uh, particularly kind of the fractures that would be on the edge. Uh, I am screws has really changed my practice. I think you're looking at a single stitch for the majority of these and you put an IM screw down for metacarpal shaft fracture. The union rates are close to 100% and they rehab super fast with soft dressing. Most of my patients are in a, truly in a Band-Aid on day three. So it's it's, uh, it's been a technique that I've really liked as opposed to plates and screws, which I still do use, and I agree with Mark. You have to have all of these in your arsenal. I loved bouquet pinning, and that's what I did before IM screws became popular. I think now IM screws makes a lot more sense. Uh, the bouquet pinning, I couldn't personally mobilize them quite as fast. They'd still, a percentage of those had to be removed at a second surgery, whereas the IM screw, you, you really, uh, you put it in, you never think about it again. And most of them come back at two weeks with great motion, so it's, it's not just defending what Jed said. It's actually been one of the few things that's really changed my practice a lot in the last 10 years is the addition of IM screws for metacarpal for real. Great. J Jerry, I know it's a little after uh, seven, but let me just, if, if you could give me a couple minutes, let me just uh, go back to my screen and I can show everybody what we did with those, um, with those cases. And um, I think you'll get, you'll get some of my, uh, my bias, but. Uh... <laughs> So here's the isolated closed, We've got an intramedullary screw, and this multiple uh, multiple metacarpal fracture, the patient already in the operating room, multiple metacarpal screws. So um, uh, for, 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 me, for me personally, I mean, I was a big bouquet pinner for many, many years, and Glenn, we probably did a bunch together. I did a kind of a modification of Boucher's technique, but I think the IM screw is really changed my practice as well. And for shaft fractures that need operative intervention, which as Milan said, is a small percentage, that's really my go-to. I haven't had any problem with MP motion uh, from penetration there. And uh, you could actually do it from proximal through the CMC joint with no problem either. So um, I'll turn it back over to you, Jerry. You guys, uh, fellows, uh, you guys did a great job again. Jerry, these, is, these sessions have been awesome. Uh, really appreciate you setting this up. It's been a, a great educational uh, experience for the times that uh, we've been uh, down due to this COVID thing. So thanks again. All right. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Glenn, for some other great sessions again. And outstanding job by all the fellows again. You guys are truly the stars of the debates and uh, great discussions. And hopefully we can find some way of continuing this in some capacity moving forward. I know people are going to hopefully get a little bit busier, back to normal a little bit more, but I will get that pull out to everybody. Uh, it's been fun. I certainly enjoyed learning from everybody who has been on the webinars the last few weeks. It's been great. So next week, just so people know, it's at 5 p.m. next week. Um, and moving forward, that's the plan. That's the time we're looking at right now. But uh, this has been great for everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you for a great job. Good job to all. Everybody have a great night. Thanks again. Be safe. Thank you. Stay safe. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.